What's up guys, back again, this time it's for McLaren. McLaren's MCL 35, unveiled yesterday, and apologies you've got no Red Bull video yet. I actually did the Red Bull video when it first was launched, and yet I've had all sorts of technical issues, my computer is melting right before my eyes because I've used this enormous picture to get some mega detail, but it just can't process it. It's still got something like two hours of processing to go, and I started it last night, which is well over 12 hours ago now. Anyway, we'll get to that at some stage, you'll see it, but right now let's talk about McLaren. Um, the MCL35 is a car that's got perhaps a lot of hype attached to it, a lot of expectation, because they're a team that are on the up. Um, in 2018, McLaren had a bit of a dog, and they knew they had a bit of a dog, and they understood you know, very early on exactly what the problem was. It was a fundamental issue, kind of baked into the chassis. So for 2019, they were able to take a giant leap forward by correcting that. For this year, for 2020, you know, there is no obvious massive failing with last year's car. They were best of the rest outside the top three. That's a big achievement, particularly considering where they've been in the past uh, few seasons. So this year, it's more about eking out the final bits of performance, isn't it? They're going to struggle, perhaps, because their relationship with Renault is coming to an end. And I can tell you from experience, when McLaren kind of became, uh, it became known they were leaving or parting ways with Mercedes, things began to change and it's nothing massive, it's nothing deliberate, but it's tiny amounts, but that's what Formula One's built on. You start to get less information. You start to get information a bit later than you otherwise might do. And those kind of things can make a difference to a team. So we'll keep, on, keep an eye on that with interest as the season goes on. But let's take a look at the car anyway, because I've had a quick look around this. I don't think there's anything massively groundbreaking in terms of giant leaps from where they were, but that's probably to be expected. It's kind of what's happening with most teams right now. Uh, it's a decent looking car. Uh, I actually quite like the livery, um, but not that, not that that's the most important thing about it, but I quite like it. It seems relatively simple at this stage. There's lots of areas that I would expect. They are definitely holding back, as with most teams, I guess, but I imagine lots of work, extra work, will be done in this area, in the barge board area, because at the moment they seem pretty basic. But let's have a look at the front end and see what changes they have made. Now for me, some of this is quite interesting. They have definitely made some changes around the front part of the car. The nose is slightly different, a bit of an evolution from where they were last year. Massive gap underneath the thumb tip of the nose to try and drive as much air airflow through the middle of there. And then underneath a cape that you'll see more of in a moment that they did have last time around, pushing it out down towards the uh, central, the, the early part of the floor, the leading edge of the floor. Um, that area is all about doing that. It's about controlling, getting as much airflow at high speed into that zone uh, at the front of the chassis, front of the floor, where it can be squeezed through that tiny gap between the floor and the racetrack, accelerated, pressure drops, as I keep saying, pulling the car down onto, onto the tarmac. Um, front wing, slightly different. This, team, this time around, they've, at least on this spec, on the launch spec, they've gone for a... I guess somewhere in between like a Ferrari and perhaps what they had last year. McLaren last year using a bit more of this area for downforce production. At this stage, they seem to have gone for more of an outwash effect from the front wing. Loads of teams tried this different, uh, different specs of this last year. I expect McLaren will do the same over the coming weeks. You'll see in a moment there's a little cutout on the uh, trailing edge of the end plate just to try and encourage that outwash out through that part of the outboard span of the wing and out past the tyre to take with it that messy, horrible, turbulent, messy airflow that's tumbling around that front tyre that the aerodynamicists really don't want anywhere near the car. By ejecting it out in that direction, out way away from the car, it becomes no longer your issue. Nice slim nose cone as well. Again, we saw that again last year, but aerodynamically that's much preferred. Um, as I mentioned in another video, it's a challenge in terms of getting the FIA crash tests passed, given that your structure is so much narrower. A lot more work has to go into the construction of that, but they seem to have done that last year and followed on with it this year as well. The camera mounts, as a few teams are doing now, out on little stalks, because you can then use these uh, mounts, these stalks, as aerodynamic aids as well. So they're all aerodynamically profiled. Now, what is quite noticeable from this car, very different, for example, to something like the Ferrari, is how high the suspension is. Look at this, the uh, lower wishbone up really high. Look how far up the wheel rim the lower, uh, lower wishbone is. In fact, so high up that the steering track rod is in line with the lower wishbone 
rather than the way it is on some teams in line with the upper wishbone. And they've also got the upper wishbone so high up the chassis, they've got a little bit like Mercedes did, the top wishbone linked onto the upright using a, a big stalk. Uh, very, very strong. This has to be incredibly structural because the loads going through that are amazing. That there is a little kind of L-shaped uh, or angled-shaped bracket that attaches to the top of the upright. Now, on other cars, the top wishbone attaches directly to the upper, uh, upright itself. But here, to raise this all up, they've come out on a, on a stalk. Now, the reason they do all this is to get all of this suspension up much higher than it otherwise would be. So there's a nice clear path, a nice clear channel for all the work that's going on off these front wing tips to pass through here uninterrupted and then be picked up by this complicated barge board area and on it goes down towards the rest of the car. If the suspension is lower, it has to navigate through that and that can be tricky. It's, an, it's something that upsets the flow or has to be diverted around those wishbone and suspension components. By moving the whole lot up, yes, you raise your center of gravity, which is a negative, but you do gain the benefit of perhaps a much more efficient flow through this really important part of the car. Uh, wing mirrors, very similar to what's become the trend, I guess, on many cars now. The stalk itself being used for aerodynamic benefit, pretty much the same. There's lots of, t lots of teams now converging on a number of different designs. And that's to be expected. We are coming towards the end of a long period of stable regulations. And uh, you're finding that lots of teams are coming up with very similar solutions to the same problems all around the car. The wing mirror is a definite example of that. Quite a few teams with a very, very similar solution on their cars to the way that McLaren have gone here. Um, the rollover hoop, uh, nice and wide and oval shaped, uh, more in the, the sort of in line with Mercedes and with Red Bull very different to that of the Ferrari and the Haas that we've seen so far, of course. It's a good image as well, this one, to show you what they've done with the side pods. Now this piece here that you can see right in front of the side pod, uh, on the image it's above the suspension, that's the FIA crash structure that every team has to have. Now this is fairly standard now up and down the field. The side pod used to protrude all the way forward to that crash structure. In fact, that crash structure used to be buried within the side pod itself. You could never see it before. Now what's happened is people have shuffled the side pod entrance back using this uh, mandated crash structure that has to be there as an aerodynamic aid. So that's now profiled, helping to direct the flow into this great big opening that's there for cooling, radiators for the power unit and other elements of the car. But what you can also see is the big sweeping undercut, really nicely profiled undercut of the side pod there. Really high raised opening but a sweeping undercut and that's to drive flow through off these barge board area through this gap here and then underneath the undercut of that side pod following it round picking it up on elements along the edge of the floor sending it around the side of the top body the engine cover and in towards that crucial coke bottle area the narrowed area right at the back of the car where it exits over the top of the diffuser and really helps to power a lot of that performance from the diffuser, dragging airflow out of there, trying to accelerate that flow out the back. The more you can do that, the more you can suck through the floor itself and the more you can push the car down onto the racetrack. So this area all the way around here, absolutely critical in that sense. Right, looking at this final picture then, you can really get an impression of the nose cone, how you can see this big long sweeping cape, as I've seen on other cars as well, but designed to pick up the flow and create this tunnel-like effect Underneath the nose, you saw the big wide entry to the nose cone, underneath the thumb tip, all of that flow being passed through this tunnel, accelerated on its way down and directed very purposefully towards the front of that floor. These uh, openings, these slotted gaps on the side of this uh, curtain, if you like, on the side of the nose cone or the wing mounts, doing pretty much the same thing, dragging airflow from the outside into that section there and channeling it in towards the front of the floor. Really, really important area in any car. Uh, that's the little cutout I was telling you about, very small, but they're designed to encourage that outwash out through that gap past the front wheels. Um, barge boards, pretty simple at this stage. I mentioned it before, but I expect lots of work to be done here. Almost every other team has maximised the area up here. That's a tiny little window of, of space that you're allowed for mounts or, or fins, winglets on the side of the chassis. Some have bolted them to the chassis or moulded them to the chassis. Others have protruded them up from the barge board and it just helps to work 
uh, the flow coming off the top of the suspension arms and on towards wherever it needs to go. McLaren at this stage haven't done that, but I would say let's not read too much into it because almost certainly these things will change as time goes on. Um, you get an idea here of what they've done on the side pod. That's that big crash structure piece I was talking about, like a giant blade gathering airflow to send into the cooling ducts. Above that is the orange horizontal winglet, again, that lots of teams have adopted now. Another area where everyone's starting to converge. Mercedes have gone slightly different in their solution, but lots of teams now with one horizontal blade coming out, one big vertical fin coming up the side from the floor, and all about, as I say, controlling the flow along the side of this uh, floor and engine cover and the top orange horizontal blade there helping to direct the flow along and towards things like the rear wing and the back of that uh, engine cover area. Um, what is quite interesting I guess and, and a change from last year is up here at the roll hoop you can see from this angle what they've done is they've actually undercut the, the roll hoop so the roll hoop opening actually slants backwards towards the rear of the car uh, forward most at the top to, but rearwards most at the bottom and the piece where the marshals have to slot their straps if they're ever lifting the car onto a from a crane or onto a low loader on the racetrack you have to have that within the regulations normally that's encased within the roll hoop McLaren have slanted their roll hoop back so far they've actually put a little loop just underneath the roll hoop there which is for that purpose that's the little tiny loop that the straps the marshals will lift the straps through uh, or lift the car from Amazing really to see just how tiny that loop is um, and yet the entire weight of the car will be lifted by that. So that just shows you the, the structural integrity that these things have to have. It's also part of the rollover crash structure of course as well so it has to be incredibly strong up there. Uh, we can see lots of little divisions inside the overall roll hoop as well, the air intake uh, channeling off to different areas, cooling different properties on the car. Engine radiators, batteries, electronics, all sorts of things that need cooling airflow in there will be sent off via that uh, inlet at the moment. The top body, not quite as slimmed down as I've seen, certainly like the Ferrari, for example, really tightly packaged at the rear end. And, and I do wonder if this is one of the issues with not being a manufacturer. You know, McLaren have this relationship with Renault where they are simply a customer, nothing more than that. And therefore, Renault provide them with a power unit, McLaren then have to deal with that and package it and fit it into or fit their aerodynamics around it. You know, if you are a Ferrari, if you're a Mercedes, even if you're a Red Bull now with the relationship they have with Honda, you end up working and designing your power unit completely together with the design of the aerodynamics of your car. You know, one can request things from the other and tell them, look, we need to do this, can we accommodate it? And they'll work together on that solution. That's not what McLaren have. They have an issue in that they are simply a customer and Renault will always put Renault first, designing a power unit to suit their car, and McLaren will eventually get that delivered to them. That's how it works. And when Ron Dennis said years ago, you can't win in Formula One unless you are a manufacturer or aligned to a manufacturer, those are the reasons that he's talking about. Anyway, I think it's a nice looking car. To me, it looks relatively simple, simplified at this stage. And that's often the case with these launch spec vehicles. Uh, we'll see it evolve over the next few weeks. Certainly next week at testing, I expect to see a few more bits in the second test, loads more bits coming to every single car. And then again, probably by the time we get down to Melbourne. Um, but it's interesting. It's got some interesting pieces. The back of the, the top body, by the way, uh, big undercut in this area here towards the Coke bottle. Um, but the back of the side pod or, or top body rather extended out quite a lot to shroud the suspension components and that's to give aerodynamic benefit of course uh, the overall mass of that piece is bigger than we've seen on some other cars but they're getting more aerodynamic benefit from the shrouding of those messy components at the rear of the car can't see too much of the suspension at this stage uh, so we won't focus on that too much floor again will start to change massively but pretty standard now less in the way of vertical flick ups along the edge of the floor but lots of slot gaps to try and help seal uh, this area at the back of the floor between the floor of the car and the racetrack. A reasonably high rake on this McLaren and that's a crucial area for anybody trying to employ that tactic of raising the back of the car up. There's more downforce to be gained by having a high rake car but of course the difficulty in sealing the gaps and making it all work is slightly more complex. If you can get it to work, brilliant, you've got to, you know, you can maximise the downforce you can get. If you can't though, if it doesn't work at certain speeds and attitudes 
as aero loading pulls down on, and pushes down on the car suspension, then you really are in trouble. And not only are you in trouble in terms of speeds and downforce, but you start to overheat tires and you're into a world of pain. So a complicated way to go about racing with a high rake, but if you can make it work, extremely beneficial. Let's hope this one carries on where it picks off or where it left off last year.